Excited Utterance, the Evidence and Proof Podcast. Episode 72, Morgan Burke. Problems with juror bias in viewing body camera video evidence. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your guest host, Alex Nunn, from the University of Arkansas School of Law. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting-edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. Our guest today is Morgan Burke, an alumna of Michigan Law School. My episode with Morgan centers around her recent paper, Do You See What I See? Problems with Juror Bias in Viewing Body Camera Video Evidence. As you'll hear, Morgan's project focuses on the rise of police body camera footage in the courtroom. Initially, proponents thought that the existence of body camera footage would revolutionize policing, both on behavioral and accountability fronts. But recent years have seen that goal not reach its fruition, as body camera footage has had a notably muted effect in the courtroom. Seeking to explain this trend, Morgan points to a growing literature on the subjectivity of video interpretation. For Morgan, simply introducing police body camera footage into the courtroom is not enough. Instead, such evidence must be accompanied by juror instruction and education if it is to be evaluated impartially. My conversation with Morgan today therefore begins with a look at the growing movement in favor of police camera footage before we focus in particular, on how it's faring in the courtroom. Morgan, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. So before we jump into the heart of your paper, I want to first just set the stage. So your project begins by suggesting that a, quote, revolution in policing occurred back in 2014, when there started to emerge this kind of widespread movement demanding that police officers wear body cameras. So let's start there. What was the cause of that revolution in policing, as you call it? So that was when Michael Brown, an 18-year-old college student, was shot six times in Ferguson, Missouri. He was a black college student shot by a white officer and then left on the street to die. And it took hours for anyone to move his body. Ferguson totally erupted in protest. There was a week of people on the streets. The governor declared a state of emergency. There was a curfew imposed. And Something about Michael Brown's death just really seemed to shock the conscience of society, and people were really angry, and I think rightfully so. And almost immediately, there were calls from accountability, and one of the things that seemed to catch on with basically everyone, from the public to the Obama administration to police unions to the ACLU, everyone seemed to support this call for body cameras with police officers. And what was the goal of that movement or that call for body cameras? Did the proponents believe that it would actually change police behavior? Or as you mentioned uh, a second ago, was it to provide additional accountability? Or what was kind of at the heart of that movement? So it seems like there's different reasons behind each of the group's support. Police reform advocates believed it could be a tool for eliminating some of the he said, he said in the encounters between police and communities. And they thought that there might be actually more accountability for the police and it might deter police misbehavior if they could be seen on camera and judge for their actions. But on the other hand, police groups liked it because they thought, oh, you know, people can now see what we're dealing with and see what police officers see because the cameras are literally from the officer's perspective. So people are actually seeing sort of what the police are seeing. So both sides seem to have a little bit different way of coming at their support, but it seemed like it definitely differed based on who was advocating the change. Great. And it's now, of course, been almost five years since those initial events in Ferguson, Missouri, that you described. So how successful, in your opinion, has this policing revolution been? That is, approximately how many police officers, say, now use body cameras, and and how has it altered their behavior? So as of 2017, 95% of law enforcement agencies said that they intended to implement a full body camera program. But as of January 2019, only about half of law enforcement agencies have actually implemented these programs. And then we're starting to actually go the other way when a lot of departments are starting to actually get rid of body camera programs because they're just really expensive to store video long term. and Honestly, as far as success goes, the consensus seems to be that it's not a perfect solution that people thought it was going to be. There have not been really any convictions of police officers who have been using these body cameras. And 
it really hasn't seemed to make any change at all in how these cases are brought forward and ultimately charged and convicted. I want to build on that last point that you just mentioned, because your paper talks about that despite the increasing adoption of police body cameras, the cameras have had a muted effect not only outside the courtroom, but also in the four corners of the courthouse. And the existence of body camera footage has neither led to a significant increase in convictions, as you just mentioned, nor really a material change in officer behavior. And that was surprising to me. And your paper suggests that the phenomenon that might be to blame here is implicit bias. So I want to unpack that claim in full. But first, let's just define what's your working definition of implicit bias for this project? I define implicit bias as the internal unconscious ways that individuals hold stereotypes and attitudes about groups of people. So basically, Implicit bias is associations, which psychologists call stereotypes and attitudes that cause people to associate a group of people with some trait. And these associations are beneath the surface and can still influence how people act, even without that person knowing that it's influencing how they act. Even if someone says that they're not racist and they truly believe that they aren't, they probably still have some underlying attitude or stereotype about a certain race or a certain group of people that changes the way that they make decisions. And there are a lot of studies out there. And if you have time, I really recommend taking the Harvard Implicit Association Test. And if you Google Harvard Project Implicit, it should come up. And it's a really good way to see how even if you're outwardly egalitarian and you believe that obviously that you're not racist, you should probably see that you still have some implicit biases lurking underneath the surfaces. Great. And your paper suggests that actually there are certain entities that reinforce and kind of exacerbate this problem of implicit bias. And and what I found interesting here is that you see the news media as especially blameworthy on this front. Mm -hmm. So unpack that claim. There's this pervasive stereotype in the U.S. that black Americans are violent and criminal. And social psychologists have been documenting this data for over 50 years, but this association has been happening since the foundation of slavery in this country. What's crazy is that this association between being black and being criminal is actually bidirectional, which means that black Americans are not only associated with crime, but crime itself is actually associated with black Americans. So then let's talk about the news media. When you turn on your nightly news every day, What are the things they talk about? There's the weather, maybe there's some politics thrown in, but there's always something about like a horrific crime that happened nearby. And there are usually a few segments about these crimes. And so not only is crime overrepresented in how the news is being presented, but they also overrepresent the black individuals who are being charged and suspected of these crimes. So black individuals are overrepresented in news media as suspects or culprits of violent crime at rates that are totally disproportionate to what the actual arrest rates are. And meanwhile, on the other hand, white individuals are overrepresented as victims of violence or as law enforcement personnel. So when you see that over and over from the the news media that there's all these black suspects being involved in crime and then also these white victims, it's basically reinforcing these pervasive stereotypes of and associations of black Americans with crime. And the news is just feeding us image after image of these black individuals suspected of and charged with crimes and the white individuals being the victims of the crimes. And these numbers are totally disproportionate to how actual arrest and crime rates are. And basically churning out these images and stories at a rate that's just not true in reality. So the news media is just reinforcing the association every night. And this could absolutely affect how people come into courtrooms and see a black person on the defendant table. And just on that note, bringing the discussion back to the courtroom, how do you see implicit bias and these stereotypes that you discuss affecting jurors in particular? So as I said before, the media has fed into this racialized fear of black Americans. And I think that you can bet that the potential jurors are seeing all these newsreels of black suspects and white victims. And then when you enter into the courtroom with all of that, you're coming in with all of this baggage. And everyone is involved in society. You can't escape it. And although there might be people who don't necessarily watch as much TV, it's just pervasive. And so everyone is coming in with the images they see on their screens, with the stories they read in the newspapers. And everyone walks into the courtroom then with their own subjective experience of the world. And every juror approaches a case with their own ideas, their own implicit biases. And these are all informed by their own experience in the world, but also what they're told by the media and by the internet and by the people around them. So 
jurors aren't looking at a case and the evidence in a perfectly objective and completely open, but they are looking at it with the lenses of what they know and what their experience and education and biases are telling them how to look at things. And even if jurors don't realize it, their decision making is impacted by the things that are lying underneath the surface, especially their biases that they hold unconsciously. And one thing I found really interesting in my research is that studies have shown that people are more likely to associate black with guilty and white with not guilty. And ambiguous evidence tends to be viewed to the detriment of black parties in cases. So these biases are going to come out when jurors are looking at evidence and they'll shape the way that our courtrooms work without anyone actually coming out as openly racist. So I want to shift gears for a second and take a look at your examination of juror evaluations of video evidence, which seems like it could be a related topic here. So despite the fact that cameras, of course, produce videos through automated and mechanical processes, you nonetheless see evaluation of video evidence also as inherently subjective. So tell us about that part of your paper. So I have two main reasons that I think that video is subjective. One is, as I've been speaking about, everyone is coming at video with their own biases that shape how we actually look at and interpret the video footage in front of us. Our brains actually gap fill any missing pieces and images. So using our own backgrounds, experience, biases as our guides, if we see something in the video that is ambiguous or that we're not really quite sure what to think of, our brains will actually fill in the gap and different people will fill in those gaps totally different ways, coming out on two radically different ways to interpret that video. And then secondly, in conjunction with that, camera footage is really limited by the context and the framing of the video. And when you look at body camera footage, it's even more limited. So it's literally only giving you the perspective from the officer's chest and only when the camera is turned on. So we're getting both temporal and visual limitations when viewing all camera footage in general, but even more limited when it comes to body camera footage. So with these limitations, people are going to have to fill in the gaps. They start to speculate about what's going on off the camera, what happened before, what happened after. And then people view the footage through the lens of their own experience to try and understand the full picture. And so in that way, there's always things going on outside. So there's no way to objectively look at a video. You have to bring in your own experience to try and figure out what the context is around the video itself. What has the Supreme Court said thus far about the subjectivity of video evidence? Well, unfortunately, the Supreme Court has said its video is objective and pretty much unequivocally has stated that video can speak for itself. Scott versus Harris, the court found that a dash cam video of an officer running a suspect off the road spoke for itself and that it was a totally objective piece of evidence of the reasonableness of the officer's actions. And the court thought that no reasonable person could possibly watch the video and see anything differently. The kicker, though, was that some people actually did see it differently. And that's something that Justice Stevens is the lone dissenter pointed out. He noted that the 11th Circuit itself found that there was a material issue of fact, meaning that they saw that two reasonable people could view the video completely differently. So it kind of is really ironic that the court's decision finding that no reasonable person could view the footage another way was basically coming right after a panel of judges found that reasonable people could view it different ways. So it kind of defies logic. But the Supreme Court right now is not on my side. So, so bringing these two threads together, then the threads of implicit bias and the threads of video evaluation, which we've discussed thus far, let's discuss juror evaluation of police body camera footage. Uh, First, you identify what you described as a perspective problem here. Build that out for us. Basically, with body camera footage, we're kind of in a catch-22. In body camera and in police use of force cases, the officer's perspective is the legally relevant perspective and what jurors need to think of in deciding whether something is reasonable in terms of use of force. But body camera footage is just a tiny sliver of what actually happens. It's putting jurors in the position of the officer and gives them the actual perspective of the officer, but in a super limited way. They can't tell where the officer's hands are. They can't see what's behind the officer. They can't see what's in the periphery. Can't see the officer's face or if there's a group of officers behind or what's going on in the film. So even though the perspective is what's relevant to deciding whether the use of force is reasonable, there's so much going on with the context outside of that perspective that jurors are not seeing, that the point of view bias that they're getting when they're viewing from the officer's perspective is actually changing how they're going to make that decision. And then this point of view bias 
also is a big deal because jurors are viewing something almost as a first person participant. So there's this sense of intimacy by viewing something from the perspective of somebody else that heightens the sympathy for the officer's perspective. Not only do jurors have biases, but officers also have biases. So they're getting heightened sympathy for an officer who also holds a lot of biases, bringing in their own biases when they're interpreting the video. And so we're basically talking about multiple levels of bias informing jurors as they watch these videos. And so it just seems like there's no wonder with the perspective only coming from the officer's point of view, it's limited. And that's the relevant perspective that we're supposed to be using in determining use of force. So it kind of makes sense that there are so few convictions of officers based on body camera footage. In addition to this perspective problem, uh, you also suggest that body camera footage is susceptible to a number of other cognitive biases. How's that? So cognitive biases will shape how we interpret videos. Basically, cognitive biases are biases that are systematic patterns of deviation from rationality. So examples of these are confirmation bias, information bias, and belief bias. So basically, you view a video and you're likely to see things that confirm what you already believe. There's a really cool interactive New York Times article by Timothy Williams that kind of demonstrates how these cognitive biases affect how you interpret videos. First, you go on and the first thing you see is a question that asks you how you feel about the police, which is measured by your tendency to trust or distrust the police. And then you scroll down. The article has a video. It has no sound and it's taken from a chest mounted body camera. You watch the video and answer a follow-up question about how threatening you think the situation was to the officer in the video. The video depicted someone really close to the officer. It's got flailing limbs, fists, and there's a lot of shaking, and you can barely see anything. But most people, after seeing the video, believed that the officer was in serious danger and possibly in danger for his life. The article then, when you scroll down, shows another angle of the video from presumably a bystander video. And what you see is that the officer and the subject of the original video are just dancing. The new camera has sound, so you hear the music, and they're just dancing with each other. And so there are a bunch of other videos in the article that show just how deceptive that the body camera angle can be. But what I think is really interesting about this is that the data based on the initial answer to how much that you trust, the level of trust in the police is correlated to how often you see a serious threat. So the more a person trusts the police, the more likely they were to see a serious threat in the video. What you believed before you saw the video was indicative of how you actually viewed the video and interpreted it. So what you're coming into when you're viewing these videos is kind of more important than when you're actually seeing in the video. And that's what cognitive bias is doing as you're interpreting. And if you would, unpack your argument in the paper that body camera footage also reinforces racial biases. So when you see how the cognitive biases can influence how we interpret video, it's really not hard to see how your racial biases can do the same thing. If you come in with trust for the police, you're more likely to see a threat to the police. If you come in associating black people with crime or violence, you're more likely to see the subject on the body camera committing a crime or violence if that person is black. If you think someone's committing a crime or a violence, you may gap fill and use that gap filling to justify the use of force for the officer. Studies show that people see weapons on black subjects at higher rates than on white subjects, and especially in ambiguous videos. And if there's a weapon or people think there's a weapon, people are definitely more likely to think that use of force is appropriate. So all these biases are coming together. And the racial biases, I think, are going to drive people to see ambiguous ambiguous evidence as detrimental to black subjects who are subjected to use of force by the police. And so when you bring all of these together, people's racial biases are going to basically make it so I think people are more likely to justify use of force on black victims in these cases. So Morgan, what can be done here? Uh, and, And in particular, what steps can courts take to mitigate the biasing potential of video in the courtroom? Basically, if you bring up prejudice, white people are less likely to be prejudiced, to avoid looking like they're prejudiced. So attorneys themselves can bring up race as a salient issue just in voir dire. Attorneys can slip in questions about egalitarian values, and that 
even though you might not actually be weeding people out based on those, you could actually decrease the likelihood of jurors expressing racial bias later on. You do have to be careful because there are studies that show if you're too heavy handed, apparently this could backfire and not only bring out implicit biases, but explicit biases of jurors because they want to kind of assert their freedom to do what they want. But I think slipping in a couple of questions about being egalitarian can help attorneys themselves start to just bring up race as a salient issue. One really simple way is just to include black people on a jury. Having just one black juror reminds white jurors about the egalitarian values they supposedly espouse. And obviously, there are issues with specifically choosing black jurors to be on a jury because they are black. But in widening juror pools and limiting peremptory strikes, you can be really effective in making juries more diverse. And then one way I really like, because it's just so easy for the courts to do, is to provide just subtle implicit bias training in the form of jury instructions. Judge Mark Bennett already includes these jury instructions and has written an article about his jury instructions, which basically asks the jury just to recognize the potential of implicit bias and to think critically about every piece of evidence while trying to resist those biases. And he basically couches those instructions in accurate scientific terms and then makes the language about biases universal and basically makes a case for the universality of biases so that jurors are not as defensive about it. And by doing that, jurors are more likely to actually be less prejudicial in viewing their bias. And then finally, and the most obvious, but definitely the most difficult to accomplish, is just rooting out bias in policing in the first place. If we can train law enforcement to better handle bias in their policing, there could be fewer cases where body cameras actually matter in determining whether bias is changing the way that people make decisions. Final question, Morgan. What's next for the literature here? Uh, What type of paper would shed additional insight on this issue? So I think it would be really helpful to see more ways to combat implicit bias in the courtroom. There are simple ways to do it, but it just seems like there could be more to figure out how we can actually address this head on. But the one thing that I really think would be interesting to see is an article collecting all the cases and analyzing the outcomes of cases where body camera footage was involved. Um, There just aren't that many cases right now because most officers never even charged. But I think if we start to compile some actual data and see how the body camera footage is impacting the outcomes of cases, because my paper is really heavily theoretical, I think it would be a really good way to either expand, completely find that my paper was wrong, or to put some real data on what I believe is how racial bias has really impacted the way that body camera footage is viewed by jurors and by everyone involved in the criminal justice system. Well, Morgan, it's been great having you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on and talking about this important issue with us. Thanks so much for having me. Morgan's paper provides a practical and meaningful contribution to a growing literature on subjectivity in interpreting video footage. Many of our listeners will, of course, be familiar with a seminal piece in this arena, a 2012 Stanford Law Review article by a team of authors, including Dan Cahan, David Hoffman, Donald Brahman, Danielle Evans, and Jeff Raklinski. In their article, the study participants watched a video of a political demonstration. Now, half of the participants were told that the demonstrators in the video were protesting outside an abortion clinic. The other half, though, were told that the protesters objected to the military's don't ask, don't tell policy. And again, the footage shown to both groups, though, was exactly the same. The study found that participant perceptions of the video footage sharply varied based on cultural priors. For example, those supportive of the military's don't ask, don't tell policy or supportive of abortion rights were significantly more likely to claim that the footage depicted the protesters threatening or obstructing pedestrians. Those with the opposite beliefs, though, disagreed, simply observing a peaceful protest. Morgan's paper builds on that initial study and contributes to the literature by considering how the subjectivity of video analysis diminishes the effectiveness of police body cameras. The policing revolution that Morgan described aimed to put a body camera on every officer. But five years later, there's been no significant change in courtroom outcomes. How could that possibly be? Perhaps, as Morgan suggests, 
cultural priors are again to blame. Just as the participants in the Stanford study saw what they wanted to see regarding the aggressiveness of the protesters there, jurors observing body camera footage are similarly viewing their footage, perhaps, through pre-existing cultural lenses. If so, creating a truly level playing field at trial requires more than a mere willingness to produce and present body camera footage. Rather, as Morgan describes, juror instruction and education is the key. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program, as well as the Vanderbilt Institute for Digital Learning. Excited Utterance is produced by Ed Chang, and the production editor is Grace DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Francesca Rutherford, and music is provided by the Vanderbilt University Blair School of Music's Children's Cello Choir, under the direction of Kirsten Castle Greer. I'm your guest host, Alex Nunn, and I hope that you will join us next time when we take on another work in the world of evidence and proof. Thank you.